Hello, and welcome to another episode of Mythologos, the podcast of all things mythological. Uh, I enjoyed doing my episode about Stith Thompson so much, uh, I decided to make a little series out of this, the Who Was series, and just uh, bring to you an individual capsule episodes, people who were important to anthropology, folklore studies, mythography, important to me, important to Omniad, and this is one of the most influential uh, people to me, on me, and one of the most influential people in his field in the world. Now, this guy had a big life, uh, a, a incredibly long career, incredibly eventful. He did so much. Uh, it's impossible to cover it all. I can't even get into his uh, relationships. He had these sprawling, decades-long, uh, shambolic, operatic, Greek tragedy, uh, hyper-complex relationships with people that went on and on. I mean, it's a whole separate saga. He's just too interesting. But I have some handy facts that I printed out. And I, uh, unlike other uh, people I'm going to do, there's actually uh, quite a few good photographs of Alan Lomax. So I'm going to... Uh, just do this off the cuff, off the top of my head, and I'm going to show you some pictures, and then we're going to listen to some music, which is exciting, right? Right? Well, it is to me. Anyways, <laughs> uh, let's get on with this, and we are back on the PC because I just wanted to show you the beautiful Numix theme I'm using. Uh, as much as I, I actually like the default mint themes and icons, and I love the papyrus theme, but uh, it was getting dreary. And this definitely needed a refresh. I actually went through and refreshed all my laptops and everything because I have multiple desktops and I did all sorts of stuff and made them snappy. So I just love this icon theme. It is really sharp. It is really smart. I normally don't like transparencies, but this is a nice kind of a matte transparency. And uh, yeah, these icons look great everywhere. And boy, did it refresh my desktop environment. So that's our Linux moment. And of course, uh, this is from the movie Excalibur, directed by John Borman, which is basically, uh, this was going to be his Lord of the Rings movie. And he didn't get to make that. Ralph Bakshi made that. So he took all those ideas and he dumped it in Excalibur. And uh, yeah, everybody loves Excalibur. So let's get on with this. Uh, who is Alan Lomax? Um, he was primarily, his claim to fame is collecting, uh, at this point we have 20,000 recordings that he made himself, not in a studio, but in the field. Recordings of folk music. He went around the world a hundred times. I, I don't know if anyone ever traveled as much as Alan Lomax. And, uh, so he's, he's mostly remembered for his uh, contribution to the Library of Congress. This is how I discovered him in the 1980s when I got into anthropology and folklore and folk music and blues music. Uh, the first book about the blues that I ever read was his book, The Land Where the Blues Began. And uh, it had an enormous influence on my taste in music and my idea of what real music is and... Uh, my ideas on musicology and uh, it, it just uh, completely opened that door for me. I had to go and find these recordings, uh, which I eventually I did begin to collect them. Unfortunately, they're all gone. I once had an enormous vinyl collection. I mean, gigantic. And I had to get rid of it about 15 years ago. Uh, yeah, that hurt. <laughs> and I, I had all the... Uh, Cadman and Folkways and Vanguard, these beautiful box sets of music from the Middle Ages and uh, Irish ballads and Scottish ballads and English ballads. And I had all these Alan Lomax uh, Library of Rec Congress recordings of uh, mostly of like Appalachian music and blues music and bluegrass was what I was most interested in and still am. Uh, but he went all around the world uh, and he even had like an effect on popular music. Uh, there was a whole vogue for Calypso music in the 60s. He's the person who uh, went to the islands and collected Calypso music and uh, you know, the resurgence in blues, the British blues of the 60s and American blues rock. 
he really revived the blues as a serious music that people should be interested in uh bluegrass and uh, zydeco in the 80s uh all of these things basically came from him going out and collecting recordings uh they were not on the radar there were no big pop stars of course we had like you know odetta and harry, Be harry belafonte and others but uh apart from those few anomalies mostly these were things that were not on the pop uh radar uh, uh african rhythms were really big in the 80s he was that again that was from alan lomax going on collecting uh recordings of african music but um he was born in 1915 uh in austin texas and uh, what's interesting is his father was already doing this he was doing it the old way his father john lomax and he would go uh, out with uh, a pad and a pencil and he would record quote-unquote uh western music cowboy music uh tex-mex you know uh cowboy you know mexican uh hybrid music and he would you know write out in notation the melody and copy out all the different versions of the lyrics and uh th this is how alan got involved in it um he he was very he was highly intelligent I and mean, he had like a super brain uh, but he really didn't like college and he had a lot of health problems and financial problems and eventually he just joined his dad and uh, they went out into the field uh, collecting these songs um, but then the Library of Congress stopped funding the research and uh, for years Alan went out without his dad even just by himself in the 30s and the 40s uh, just collecting folk songs he was also a musician uh he could play and he knew all knew all of these uh songs but uh let's find a good yeah uh, this is him when he was going to england ireland scotland and collecting the ballads and really this is what began the gold rush for that and all these artists i don't know if you know you're familiar but uh like uh john martin maddie Pryor, you know steel i span Fairport Convention, Planksty, uh, all these uh, groups that started doing this movies, uh, this music in the 70s, the Incredible String Band, Donovan, uh, you have uh, Simon and Garfunkel uh, doing um, uh, Rosemary uh, Parsley Sage and Time, uh, Bert Yanch, who's now, you know, uh, very uh, highly regarded, who is kind of an obscure British uh, folk guitarist. Uh, all of this and there were also all the you know the uh cadman recorded all of the child ballads and uh, sir walter scott's uh border ballads and you know then you had the like, vanguard and uh, all these archival recordings well lomax was first uh and the thing that he did different when he went out on his own <clears throat> pardon me was he didn't Ju he, he wasn't collecting them he actually was the first person to bring uh, an audio recorder with him and at that time it was recorded on wire not on magnetic tape so his earliest recordings were done on acetate which was just a wax uh, disc and you recorded directly onto the record the acid the vinyl record a wax record and then he went out with a wire recorder uh, and it was really the advent of magnetic tape that made it possible for him to really realize his ambitions uh, which was to make full recordings uninterrupted and some of these recordings from like africa and uh, australia they're like 30 records for one piece of music <clears throat> Uh, pardon me, I can't wait for allergy season to be over. There's still a touch of allergy. Ugh, it's driving me crazy. But anyway, uh, some of these songs, these uh, ritual performance pieces, these festival performance pieces are so long, they span multiple, multiple records. Some of them I've never gotten to the end of them because they're so long. Uh, some of them I only ever heard you know there's volume three and then i found volume five and then i found volume seven and it's all the same recording because he was able to do it on magnetic tape and record for hours and hours um 
But uh, eventually, he took up for his father at the Library of Congress. He presented them with these recordings, and they decided this was worth doing, and they got federal funding so that he could continue his work, which he did for 70 years. He was collecting folk music years. As I say, there's about 20,000 known recordings, and they're all um, available online for free. If you just uh, search his name, you're going to find uh, some link uh, to, to this archive. Um, and then there, there are more specific collections as well. Uh, but yeah, almost 20,000 recordings. And that's not all the recordings. Not all the recordings were processed. Not all the recordings were released. Uh, there's probably hundreds and hundreds of hours. Um, so it's just an incredible uh, job of work. Uh, for a while, he was living in Europe because uh, he was a communist and uh, he was uh, a person of interest for the FBI. And, uh, you know, this was during what's called the Red Scare. And the Red Scare was a period where communist countries were just like stacking up hundreds of thousands of dead bodies and <laughs> threatening the world with uh, nuclear annihilation. And uh, a couple of writers in Hollywood got blackballed. <clears throat> and McCarthy went too far, and uh, now we call it the Red Scare. Uh, there was something to be scared of. Um, he, he was basically a precursor to the uh, hippies of the 1960s. He was also a precursor to the social justice warrior. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, and that he did not believe in equality, he believed in equity. And this was his other great mission in life, was to spread the word about equity. Equity is an equal outcome for everyone regardless. Now, obviously impossible to divvy up the entire planet that way as uh, some people are better at things and more dedicated than, to things than other people. Uh, I don't know if he would have appreciated equity in his field of musicality, musicology and, and uh, folklore studies uh, if he was bumped and replaced uh, with someone who got equal credit for doing less than half the work and not even half as good. But uh, that's kind of the mindset there. Uh, rules for thee, but not for me. Uh, so I disagree with him on all of that, but they were pestering him and he did uh, leave the country, which is probably smart. Um, the, things did go too far in one direction and he may have lost his ability to work for the Library of Congress. So he wisely uh, just took himself out of the equation and he did an enormous amount of collection uh, in Europe. And let me see if I can uh, find it. Good. Yeah. Then when he came back, he actually had a number of radio series. And, the, it, you know, it's a kind of a lost part of his career. He made television specials. He made a couple of uh, feature film documentaries. Uh, he made documentary short subject films. He had radio series. He was very well known and popular. Um, but it's kind of hard to get a hold of these things now. Um, but yeah, he was in broadcast. Uh, where he learned a lot about audio production. And during and after this period, the quali quality of the recordings goes way up. I mean, he eventually, it's hard to tell whether or not it was in a studio or not. It was never in a studio, but his recordings were that good. And he's out there recording on an island, you know, Caribbean island or in the outback with the, the wind howling and all this. And he got incredibly good recordings. Yeah, he was a hyper intelligent person. He had a scientific mind. He had an aesthetic mind. He had a, a technical mind, and uh, he was a fantastic engineer as well. Um, so after he came back in 1959, he was in in broadcasting and working for the Library of Congress. And uh, let me see. There was a beautiful picture here. Yeah, here's uh, about the same period uh, of him traveling around the world and what he did that was interesting was he didn't just record the music he recorded the voices he interviewed the subject these were groundbreaking techniques that are now part and parcel with anthropology 
These are standard anthropological techniques now. And nobody was doing this uh, with music at the time, interviewing the musicians, treating them as musicians, not as primitives, but as artists. And he made an enormous contribution to our uh, appreciation of this music as having a genius, a genius like Bach and Mozart and Beethoven. Uh, just a different kind of genius. I feel a greater genius. The genius of the culture is far beyond the genius of an individual because the genius of the culture is a collective genius over time. It's this accretion of elements. And I, as much as I love, you know, Renaissance art, the great composers, the great poets, Virgil, Shakespeare, Milton, the great painters and the great composers of classical music and opera, it doesn't have the same power as that which comes collectively from the unconscious. And uh, it is artificial. What Lomax was recording was genuine. It's in a way more real. Not that it's primitive or closer to nature in that regard, but it's more closely related to natural processes and less to an individual intellectual approach or aesthetic approach. Uh, but yeah, these, <coughs> so sorry, uh, these were epic journeys. Uh, it's impossible to go into all of it. And I have a very nice, yeah. And here he is recording probably uh, an Appalachian musician it looks like and these recordings are great to hear their voices to hear them talk about their lives and about the music he didn't he did not separate their lives from the music a again this is a major part of anthropology now um, in classical uh, formative anthropology it was seen as sort of just being bundled up with the culture and individual experience didn't come into it uh, in the way you look how individual experience might have informed uh, a Western artist of the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Victorian era, and so on. But Lomax understood that they were artists and uh, he captured their voices. It's very powerful stuff uh, listening to these, especially the old timers, talk about everything that they've seen and experienced. Um, so just a couple of interesting things to add to that it's it's just too much I, you could there's like a two and a half hour documentary about him that barely scratches the surface but uh, a couple of interesting things one is he discovered muddy waters the great blues man muddy waters he went looking for robert johnson but robert johnson was dead so he asked around, uh, is there anyone else? And everyone said, oh, you gotta go to the plantation and talk to Muddy. You gotta find Muddy. And uh, these recordings exist, acetate recordings. They're very low quality, but uh, absolutely brilliant uh, to listen to. Uh, it, it was before Muddy Waters was Muddy Waters. Of course, Muddy Waters gave us Manish Boy, which became bad to the bone. Remember uh, George Thurgood? But everybody knows this riff. Well, that was the Muddy Waters riff. And uh, he, he really made that a thing. Um, and before he went electric, he was indeed working on a plantation and uh, just playing acoustic guitar. And it was Alan Lomax who discovered him. Another interesting thing is that uh, he was a consultant on the Voyager satellite that launched in 1977. He was the musical consultant to Carl Sagan. And uh, the only reason there's any ethnic music on the disc that went out is because of Alan Lomax. But he also selected, because he loved and understood uh, classical music, he selected the pieces by Bach and Mozart and, and so on. A lot of those were his selections. And I'm old enough to remember when that satellite launched and uh, what a big to-do it was. I was a little, little kid in, in 77. I guess I was four years old. Uh, but uh, yeah, I actually remember that. It was nonstop on the news. Uh, 
uh, let's see. And, you know, he, he won many awards. Uh, most uh, prestigious being the National Medal of Arts, which was presented, it was given to him by Ronald Reagan. And it shows you what a different time it was. Uh, because now it would be a Twitter storm. I'm not accepting that reward from this president. Uh, but, but then he went and accepted it happily, uh, despite the fact that Reagan was a lifelong uh, scur communist scourge, uh, anti-communist, and uh, Alan Lomax was a, a very dedicated communist and socialist. Uh, but uh, he, did, he did live long enough to receive the Library of Congress Living Legend Award, and he was a living legend. He received honorary doctorates. Uh, he won the National Book Critics uh, Award for his book, Land Where the B Blues Began, which you got if you're interested, even if you're not, get this book and read it. It'll get you interested. It really is the best book about the blues ever written. Uh, he was nominated for Grammys numerous times. I don't think he, he won any. Um, and uh, finally, uh, he passed away in uh, the early 2000s, I think 2002, a 70 year career. Uh, <clears throat> probably more than 20,000 recordings. He influenced anthropology, musicology, pop music, culture. Um, he just was one of the all-time greats and absolutely positively one of my heroes and inspirations. So enough of that. Uh, let's listen to some music. Why not? Now, there's just too much to cover. Uh, I just pulled a couple of samples uh, from his series on uh, music of uh, the Appalachian uh, and the American South. And these are just going to um, highlight what interests me most about this and what interests me most about his work. Um, what he discovered, really, uh, he his theory that... Uh, no one really believed in until he started documenting it uh, in the field was the fusion going on in this music. And we're going to listen to two uh, different kinds of music here. Just little samples. I'm not going to play whole, whole songs. But uh, you'll see in the first set, there's a fusion. You're going to hear African uh, elements of vocal harmony. You're going to hear the gospel that developed it. And you're going to hear some Appalachian Southern elements in it. And you're, going to, you're also going to hear some blues as well. Uh, this was groundbreaking, the idea that American music was fusion music, that it had all, all this depth and relationships to other music, that it was not autonomous. And this completely changed the way that musicologists looked at, especially at traditional music. So let's just listen to a few samples here.
Okay, now the second kind of music I want you to hear, which is really fascinating, is called sacred harp music. And it's this way of doing a four-part harmony in groups. And people who can't sing a note uh, sound amazing when they're singing the sacred harp harmonies. Um, and you're going to hear, this is such a fascinating combination you're going to hear uh, some African influence. You're going to hear uh, English hymn uh, influence. You're going to hear echoes of Baroque choir. <laughs> and you're going to hear these kind of Appalachian uh, elements that became, you know, country and Western, as in the last thing uh, that I played you. And you're, you're going to hear uh, elements of uh, blues and rhythm and blues, gospel and folk all together. And this is just some of the most astonishing stuff that I've ever heard. So let's just pull some of that up. Okay, so there's even a bit of the uh, the English roundel in there as well, of uh, another form of choral singing. So uh, that was Alan Lomax. I hope that you enjoyed that. Uh, I certainly enjoyed making that. And I will be uh, back soon with more Mythologos and uh, more 
who was uh, Capsule Episodes and more Tux Lives. I'm really making uh, progress with LaTeX now. I don't know why it took so long. Uh, once you sort of crack it, it seems pretty obvious. But, um, but yeah, I have some uh, great stuff coming that way. Uh, so thank you for listening, and uh, if you enjoy this kind of content, if you're enjoying my journey of learning uh, Linux, if you enjoy my Mythologos uh, episodes, uh, please uh, subscribe and hit the bell for notifications, and hit the like button and leave a comment. Uh, actually, out of all of those, comments is most important to me. I'd, I'd like to hear from you. Uh, let me know what you think of all this. Uh, so thank you for listening, and until next time, Good luck to you.